we haven't targeted specifically in that in that way. I mean, we know there's research out there, particularly in girls in maths, and I can think of my own daughter, and there's research which would suggest some of those things happen. Um, but we haven't, A, done any specific research to, to see if that's the case or, or whether that's something which we particularly targeted groups at. We haven't. I mean, that was that group of anxious individuals. We've actually got, we've got a considerable number of girls now going into our social emotional behavioural difficulties provision, which is, is, is quite a, a thing really. It's not really happened like that before, but it's, it's a lot of year nine, year 10 girls. So whether that's again something when I mean, they've, they've had the training, they're looking at how they might be applying growth mindsets in, in that context and whether the girls there particularly are, are, are going to be a focus. I don't know, we haven't. So to be honest, the answer is no, we haven't yet. We, we used it within sport. We have a, what we call the girls convention which targets year nine and ten girls who aren't necessarily engaged in physical activity to bring them along to a day where they experience lots of different types of things from dance to traditional Yoga, sports. Yeah. Um, but we do a session as part of that which we include growth mindset in there partly because again like the girl that Rachel described who had the shoe sort of screwed up and thrown in the bin, um, we know that p girls particularly can have some pretty strong negative experiences of sport and PE. And, and, and to help them understand their beliefs and where those beliefs come from and, and, and how growth mindset um, gives them a framework to work, we felt was helpful. We got some good traction on that day. Have they got a lifelong love of sport as a result? I don't know. You know it's part of a, a whole picture and I think particularly with mental health and, and, and girls particularly, it, it's such a massive picture that, that's beyond just growth mindset, but growth mindset I think has a role. We don't have SAP, we don't do the SAPs that, that the UK do, so because we are our own jurisdiction, we do a lot of teacher assessment. Uh -huh. So the, the teacher assessment, but they, um, it's, it's pretty well moderated. So they have moderation meetings and they look, you know, this is a, I think this is a level 4A, well I think this is a level 4A, do we? Yeah. Whether, goodness knows, we get it right or not. I, you know, I, I, I think this whole thing about levels is, is up for discussion. I'd, I'd love to be getting in there as the next thing, having discussions about, about levels. I go into my, uh, the high school that I'm EP for uh, last September, and one of the teachers was scratching their head saying, they've come up with this level, but actually my assessments and what we're working with is showing that actually they're not at that level. So I don't think it's, it's robust, but it's, it's there, it's what, it's what teachers, I think generally it's, it's pretty good and pretty accurate, but there are obviously examples where teachers don't feel it is. But we get children from year four already starting to stress about the 11 plus exam. Yeah. We so, asked the so PSHE curriculum, it was interesting, we, we asked, I asked a teacher, I said what was the biggest impact of the curriculum, we just said less anxiety about the 11 plus, you know, which is a worry in itself, but that's the number Parents one. Parents are starting to get their children tutored from, you know, from that, so that becomes almost instead of and potentially worse, I don't know, than who would know than, than, than the, the, the SATs, but no, we don't have the SATs. The, the, the whole thing about, um, about setting viability as well, a lot of schools have just started ditching it and, and, not, and, and really recognising what research says and in line with growth mindset, why are we setting children viability? Let's just get rid of it. And even the grammar school English department have have scrapped setting viability. So again, that's one example in one, in one school, but then the other departments are looking at it thinking, and, and the English department saying, no, this is working really well. We're getting some really good results from our students, the way we're approaching this. So hopefully then that will be an example for, for some of the other departments. Not easy though, some schools said, you know, it, it might have taken some of them three or four years to actually get to the point where every teacher is comfortable with it and is accepting of it, but it's something that they've been on the journey with, it, with and really, really trying hard on. We try to, if you like, transition from having the, the characters, the, the cuddly characters, through to stories, you know, whether it's Fantastic Mr. Fox, or moving into some of the children like cottoned onto Star Wars and getting using Yoda and Darth Vader as the, the fixed and growth mindsets. Um, and also that people can change, so Darth Vader can go from the good to bad and back. So there's all Tell sorts of. Yeah, I'm a, I love it. I'm going to write a growth mindset <laughs> Star Wars book. But, but yeah, and, but moving f through that phase then into real life people. You know, to Warren and Phil, uh, 
Warren and Phil Smith who, who, who are doing the, the, the marathons and the running, through to our other sports people, through to um, business people who've got, who you know, particularly around the 11 plus people who've gone to the high schools. So we've got a guy who's chief executive of Guernsey Post, failed the 11 plus, now runs Guernsey Post. So bringing those real, going from the transitioning, the, the characters and the behaviours has been the way that we've tried to and, do And it. finding what their, who their role models are, because mm. we know, you know, 12, 13, 14, role models are really important to them. And actually saying, well, who are your role models? And then getting them to find out about what their learning journeys have been and, and why they're famous and why they perceive them to be successful and, and trying to find their growth mindset story. Because they'll have had they'll have had failures, of course they will have had failures at time times and what can they learn from that? So making it real for them, I think. Some Part of it has also been about breaking down and, and unpicking things like Britain's Got Talent mm. and, and how people are celebrated and, and how they got to where they are. And, and a lot of people will talk now about there's a kind of, uh, we need quick fixes, it's instantaneous, it, we're not, if it's not instantaneous success, then we're not interested. And, and helping people see that that isn't actually how it works. And even, you know, on Britain's Got Talent, they, those guys go through, a, you know, a really rigorous, almost ordeal to kind of to get to where they are. They have to take critical feedback, don't they, you know, and process it. So it's using r as many real life examples as, as possible, I think. Still, self-awareness, yeah. because so many people, I think, you go around almost in a haze, unaware of kind of half of your beliefs until they're kind of brought out. Which is why, again, we found the continuums really useful. I mean, we showed them to Carol when she was over. She loved them. She thought they were great and took them away and stuff. But we know we haven't gone through a process of validating them academically. But as a wonderful conversation starter, when I first did it. We were at a tournament, a cricket tournament in rugby, and it just rained for three days, and there I was just sat twiddling my thumb. So, literally broke cricket down, and I surveyed every single team and gave the, the coaches the results. And the conversations that sprang up with coaches in players going, you know, you really think that? Well, yeah. You know, and, and it was like the disbelief on both parties that actually you could have these contrasting beliefs. And, and the understanding that it generated was massive. And I, and I think... And, whether it's feedback, 360 degree appraisals, until you generate more self-awareness, it's really difficult, it's impossible to change, I think, because but at least when it's in your conscious mind, you can actually then make a decision to challenge yourself and be aware of what you're thinking a little bit more. But I think also it's provided, in some ways, a safer way for adults to challenge each other. So you might get someone coming to the staff and saying, oh, I can't believe, you know, I really can't do that, and then someone over there will pipe up yet. And it just, it just brings out that, well, you're not being very growth-minded about that, rather than saying stop being a complete whatever. Or it, it, it's, we've heard examples where that's, that's happened and is happening. So that freedom or feeling safe to challenge each other, again, brings it into people's conscious awareness, stops and makes people think, oh, yeah, I did just say that, didn't I? Oh, well, maybe I need to think differently. Um, and I think that's quite a powerful way of, of getting change and getting the adults themselves to start thinking about, oh, okay. I think, I think added to that, I mean... If I give you two examples, one is how the education department has changed and how education staff talk about the culture within the organisation based on the, cha on the new leadership that's there and, and how John, who's our chief officer, actually operates and that you know, it's not hire or fire, you know, it is about developing, everyone's there together. And I think fix, fixed and growth minds, they're situational as well and, and situations can change how we perceive different things. So I think it's not to be undermined or uh, sorry, forgotten actually the role that um, the leadership play in any environment in, in shaping the culture. And grandparents, it was pointed out to us yesterday, which I think we often say in our chat, oh, and grandparents are the worst. They always say how clever or whatever their grandchildren are, but we haven't, we haven't actually targeted grandparents in a way, but I think the next school that asks for us to deliver training, well, they're going to do training with parents, we might say to them, actually, if the grandparents aren't looking after the children so the parents can come, invite the grandparents along as well. So we have, we've done training in schools, but obviously we recognise that that's not something everyone's going to engage in. Um, I don't know other than what we said last mm. night. So about one, of the things that one of the things primary schools have done, they've coincided it with a, a film night. So the teachers come in and the parents bring the children in with them. Uh, there's a film for the children to watch whilst the parents come in and sit in with the, yeah, the training. Husband, the other thing, I mean, Dun we were talking about Dundee <coughs> yesterday, you've got a, a massive Tesco's up there, which must be, God knows how many people work in it. But actually, the employer's route is a really powerful one. 
Again, Social Security, you know, we've done the work with Social Security. Social Security now wants us to actually go and do some work with the job seekers themselves. So I think it has to be the community approach, but one of the, one of the things is, is, I think it is actually not expecting them to walk Come through to the us. door, but actually go out to them. You have to find a place to engage with them, which is their turf, because when we did the Rachel School, we first went in there. I mean, the, the attendance for parents evenings is so poor, but actually, if you look at the information that came out of school, for that group of parents, it's actually quite intimidating. You know, some of them are illiterate. You know, they don't have an, and, to, and to get all that, they actually almost feel intimidated at the moment something drops in through the letterbox from school, let alone actually going into the school to be told something by a teacher. So, But somehow as well, how, how we communicate things to parents. I mean, one of, one of the secondary schools, when I was looking at one of the end-of-year school reports for a child, it was just a rag-rated thing on their grades. You know, were they meeting their particular grades? And that was pretty much all it said. You know, we could communicate a lot better to parents about the progress they're making, the effort they're putting in, that, you know, and use a more growth-minded approach. And it could be as simple as that star thing. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, the rag racing thing isn't complicated, but the message it's sending is not particularly in line with the growth mindset. So you know, for those parents who are interested in how their children are doing, thinking about how schools are communicating that to parents yeah. just, just through that process. Through that first year, we saw massive issues almost with the way it was um, formalised in the fact that if their attendance, if they, if they weren't performing to the level in a specific subject, if their attendance was up, if their um, effort grade effort, was if high, their, if their, or their behaviour was okay and something else was okay, then the thing that must be missing must be their effort. So they then got <laughs> red for, for their effort. Whereas actually, like two of the kids I knew through sport, the one thing you could never question about those kids is their lack of effort, but it defaulted to, oh, it must be their effort. Nothing to do potentially with the quality of teaching or, <laughs> or anything else, but there were so many holes in it when you actually analysed it, it's quite worrying. We w went down to a school in, in Essex and we asked them about how they engage with parents. They said, well actually, it's something we haven't put a lot of time and effort into doing. We're relying on the children actually to be taking this on board from what we're teaching them and, and how that you know, our approach to helping them learn. And what they're doing now is that they're finding the children are challenging their parents when their parents are saying they can't do something or the children are saying, well, I can't do it yet, but you know. so. Again, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but it's, it, it is as many ways as you can. I don't know, obviously, things in different languages. Yeah, I mean, our approach, I don't know whether I'm answering the question or not when I, when I say this, but our approach is that we're an island of 65,000 people. You can't change your people. You can't you know, ship another load in and ship the others out. You actually have to change the people. And, and I think the only sustainable way is actually to promote real change in, in, in the individuals, and that starts with the parents, the teachers. It actually starts with our government as much as, much as anything. And there's a wonderful, um, we were lucky enough to hear Phil Zimbardo, another Stanford professor, talk last June, but he talked about um, a model of social psychology around the bad apple, the bad barrel, or the bad barrel maker. Um, you can spend a lot of time trying to fix bad apples, and you can spend a lot of time, time trying to fix bad barrels, but Actually, if you fix the bad barrel maker, you don't get any bad apples at all. And how the system, if you can create systemic change, like for us, if we remove the 11 plus, that would probably be one of the single biggest things to create more of a growth-minded community. A very simple change to make, but actually we have to educate all of our politicians, so actually they, who all went to the two schools that probably benefit the most by the system. So what you're seeing is they educate all the poor, that's an easy one, not you? Yeah. <laughs> But I think within a school, though, it is, it is about the processes and the procedures that are that making sure they are in line with the growth mindset. So you could walk into a school which doesn't use the words growth mindset, but everything it does embodies that. And, and then it would be sustainable because it's about the processes that are there. And I, thinking of example, I mean, one of our primary schools uses a, a Kagan approach. I don't know if you know about Kagan. It's an it's a approach to a, it's a way of teaching which is all about collaborative learning and it's a manual about this thick. And, but they've been doing it for the last four or five years and it's really embedded really embedded in, in, in what they do and it is in line with the growth mindset you know you could walk in there and, and you would feel growth mindset in, in everything that's pretty much everything and they're one of the first schools to completely get rid of all setting um, and it talks about growth mindset as well in, in the manual to a point but it's it's that isn't it how do we create that and Durrington High School it, interesting that they're, they're just they're stopped they I don't know how far into their journey are they have three four years maybe but looking at things like <coughs> not having levels, not communicating levels home, not, not giving children levels or predicted grades, and, and that being part of 
what they do and looking at how they're going to, you know, this is what we want a child to be able to do, these are the knowledge, the skills that we want them to be able to do in history by the end of year 11. Let's work back and say, okay, from year 7, you know, this is what it's going to look like incrementally and let's just, you know, assess on whether they can do these things and then uh, and the next net, but not tell them that it's level, it's a grade, it's what they're learning and it's the skills and knowledge. So that's, I, I, other than those sorts of things, I can't, there's no magic it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work. I get quite frustrated in some ways and I get quite passionate about it, but so much <coughs> of it just, it comes down to people with, and particularly the people who are the decision makers. Um, I mean, in our environment, we have a, we have, we have a daily press that is probably not as constructive as it could be. As soon as GCSE results, the thing they love to do is tear into education. And, and you can see at times, in lots of different circumstances, that pressure just filters down the change and, en and ends up at, with the children. And again, I think that's what our chief officer does so well, is actually act as a massive buffer for all of that pressure for so many people. And, and, and he invests in his people. I mean, I'm not going to embarrass Morag, but I watch how Morag works again in terms of growing the foundation, what the foundation stands for in terms of leadership. It's, that's what you've got to protect your people. And, and it, it's about creating a culture and an environment where you, you celebrate people and grow them rather than chop and change them. And I think if we can really understand that and, and invest in people, then, you know, really invest in people, not just a token gesture, then, then you're going to be more sustainable. But you can write down all the manuals and the processes and everything, but if you don't really invest in your people value that, then you're not going to do it. Thank you.